Hi, everyone. Welcome to my final thoughts episode on the abortion debate. For the month of October, I hosted four podcasts, two pro-life, two pro-choice, and I'm here with you to share my opinions on what I learned and what I liked and what I think governments should focus on going forward. Welcome to the Strong and Free podcast, where my goal is to showcase multiple perspectives on the topics and ideas of our time. Regardless of your politics and views, you will find a home here because I simply have no agenda to push. My name is Christopher Balkrin, and let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Strong and Free podcast. And um, thank you so much for listening to my series on abortion. I know it's not the dinner table conversation that many of you have, and it's not a topic that you bring up with your friends. Um, But, you know, I'm so thankful that you're listening. I'm so thankful that people are reaching out. I'm always trying to get better and leveling up, as I like to tell my friends. Um, And speaking of leveling up, um, I want to share with you uh, my new website, www.thestrongandfreepodcast.com. Uh, it's the one place on the internet that has everything uh, that I'm putting out there in, in one place. So it's got the podcast. Um, I'm trying to get my blogs that I used to write on Medium over uh, to the blog section. Uh, it's got the contact form. And uh, hopefully in the future, I'm hoping uh, I'll be able to continue doing YouTube videos. I really want to do video podcasting. Um, and yeah, it's just a really great place to to learn a little bit about me, why I created the Strong and Free podcast, and also for you to leave your feedback. And I'd really appreciate it if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, leave me a review. Let me know what I'm doing right. Let me know what I'm doing wrong, what you'd like to see improved. I can only get better if you uh, if you provide that feedback, and it could be totally anonymous. So let me know what you think. I'm always up for for a conversation. So head over there whenever you can. Associated with that is, you know, I created a Patreon account for the Strong and Free podcast. It's still early days. And so I'm going to keep building on my Patreon account. Um, the tiers that you see there are are just based on what Patreon gives me. <laughs> so as a po- when you register as a podcaster, it gives you these selected tiers. So I'm always learning. I'm always trying to level up. Uh, but Patreon's a great way for you to show your support uh, of this podcast. As you know, it's some of you who uh, who know me personally know I pour a lot of my my time, my blood, sweat, and tears into this because I want to make this so much bigger than what it is. And I'm never fully satisfied, but I'm always committed to to working harder on the best podcast episodes. And that's why for, you know, starting in September and now into October, I started this new kind of format of taking one topic and looking at it from multiple perspectives for a month. And uh, I'll get into that in a bit. But yes, Patreon, the link is on my website. It'll be in the show notes as well to this episode. I also... Uh, you know, I started hosting my my podcast on Buzzsprout. Um, and if you're not uh, familiar with Buzzsprout, which you wouldn't be unless you're into the podcast world, you know, it's just a great format. Um, I used to be on Anchor. It's a free source. And I would always, always, always recommend Anchor. If you're thinking about starting a podcast, go to anchor.fm and, you know, start there. It's the best place. It gets your podcasts out to all the major platforms it's it's really good. It's free. You know, it's really good for for those that are just starting out. So, again, head over to Anchor.fm if you're thinking about starting a podcast, um, and then uh, yeah, think about other options as you grow your podcast, like Buzzsprout, which is great because it gives you so much detail uh, on who's listening, when they're listening, what's your attention like. So, anyways, uh, that's all stuff that I'm doing to to level up <laughs> in the in the podcast game. Um, you know, with a website now, I'm trying to learn more HTML and CSS coding. Um, I'd love, and this is just a little pipe dream of mine, but I'd love for there to be a section on the website called uh, my reading list. And on this reading list, it would have books that I'm reading right now, books that I want to read, and then, you know, book recommendations that any of you have. And the reason I want to do this is because I really do want to showcase to you that I am I am trying my best to to learn from different people, authors, um, uh, writers, uh, you know, professors, to understand different viewpoints. I'm not just reading what I agree with, and I think that's something that 
we all fall in a trap of many times. You know, we we read books, we consume media. You know, it's confirmation bias. So I just want to showcase that again. I'm actively trying uh, to to read as far and wide as I can about the topics that I have on this podcast. So, anyways, shameless plug for the Strong and Free Podcast dot com. Uh, there's a Patreon account associated with it. Check it out. Let me know what you think. And let's get on to my final thoughts on abortion. So when I decided to start this podcast series, a lot of my friends were like, Chris, why are you talking about abortion? You have no experience with it. Uh, you've never been in a relationship where your partner was considering it. You know, you really don't have that that personal experience with abortion. Um, you know, and some people even said, because you're a man, you have no right to, to comment on it, uh, which I always find is funny because, you know, I have opinions on a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that I'm, because I'm not personally connected, doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion. I don't know. Anyways, okay, so there's no, there's no public policy that could be more personal, in my opinion, than abortion. It's probably why we don't bring it up as a dinner table conversation. Um, it's probably why we don't actively talk about it with our family and friends. But I noticed that there's there's a big uh, gap between you know, what our politicians say when they say, I'm your, I'm your pro-choice candidate or I'm your pro-life candidate uh, versus what Canadians actually think. And, you know, it's hard to go out on the street and say like, excuse me, uh, do you want to talk about abortion? Um, because nobody wants to do that even on a good day. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that politicians are so, they're so honestly sometimes obsessed with coming out and saying, I'm your pro-choice or pro-life candidate. It's almost like they have to state their opinion on abortion right away. And when you look at the polls, it's really interesting. Um, Ipsos Reid put out a poll about abortion back in 2017, and it found that over 70% of Canadians believe that abortions should be permitted, but that only 53% of Canadians believe it should be whenever the woman decides. So to me, that's interesting. Um, largely, we're, we're largely for abortion, but we're not always for it when, whenever the woman decides. So to me, that shows that not everyone believes in abortion all of the time. And I kept coming back to this, um, you know, entering this, I thought I'm pro-choice a hundred percent. And then I realized, am I really pro-choice? <laughs> and then I realized maybe I'm, maybe I'm pro-life. And then I realized, I don't think that there's many of us who are always pro-choice or always pro-life. And so that, you know, honestly, when I was thinking about a podcast topic to to do, I thought, what better way to explore this than through a multi-part series um, with both pro-choice and pro-life groups? So I got to Googling, and what I did was I tried to uh, you know, find um, all the the pro-choice and pro-life groups, which is quite frankly quite easy to do. Um, you could just Google pro-life groups Canada, and a whole list comes. I think there's even like a Wikipedia page about about this. Um, but they all come up, and there there are many many pro-life and pro-choice groups, so it's very easy. And I will say, all four organizations that I reached out to wrote back almost immediately, saying that they'd love to be on the podcast. So that gives me hope that pro-life and pro-choice groups are willing to actively engage in a real conversation about abortion. Um, and so that, that to me was really fascinating. You know, I would send out emails and within a day, maybe two, I'd get replies being like, I'd love it, you know, reach out to this person, reach out to that person. You know, I've sent them your email. Let's get this, let the, let's get this out there. And then, you know, once it's out there, we'll promote it on our channels, you know, as well. And I thought that was really great. So, I identified the organizations by, again, going on Google, looking up the organizations, learning a little bit about them, and saying, okay, this is the perspective I definitely want to want to have. So if you notice, in the pro-life uh, organizations that I had, I had Cam Cote of the CCBR, Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, um, and that group takes a very much more, I would say, like a shock kind of approach to abortion. They're the group that you see at rallies downtown in your cities with very graphic pictures of, of unborn children, unborn fetuses, however you, 
whatever lexicon works for you. Um, that's very graphic. And, and I've always wondered about the organization that promotes those images. Is that the most effective way to furthering their pro-life message? So that was one pro-life group, but it didn't mean that all pro-life groups agreed to that. That's why I interviewed the Alliance for Life Ontario, Jackie Jeffs. And in my interview with Jackie Jeffs, you know, it was very much more about education and maternity homes and showing the social supports for for women and for partners and for families. So their pro-life message was not about sharing images of unborn children slash fetuses. Their message was very much about how can we make sure that people were being educated on this topic and on the very real issue of, of, of abortion. And the same is true with the pro-choice perspective. If you notice, I... I interviewed Joyce Arthur from the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, who is a very, I wouldn't say hard and and, and strict stance, but I noticed in my conversation with Joyce that there was a certain lexicon she was using all the time, which was to describe the pro-life movement, it was the anti-choice groups. I thought that was interesting. Um, But Joyce and ARC more broadly, I found, was a little bit more... Uh, hardlined on abortion as women's rights. And then I interviewed the National Abortion Federation, uh, Dr. Jill Doctoroff, whose stance was, you know, it might have been women's rights, but primarily I found Dr. Jill Doctoroff's perspective to be, uh, it's about access, um, and it's about making sure people are aware and educating our colleges of, of doctors and physicians on abortion. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that within the pro-life and pro-choice movements, there's a variety of opinions. It's not all uniform. And I think actually that's, that's probably how we all view this. We're not always pro-choice. We're not always pro-life. But even if we are always pro-life, there's ways in which we go about uh, promoting that message. And the same as if we're pro-choice, there's ways in which we go about promoting that message. So I really enjoyed this podcast series because of those four unique and diverse groups within the camps that they represent. Um, and I will tell you that this series is the most listened to series or four episodes I've ever done. So clearly, clearly, there are so many of you out there that are genuinely curious about abortion, and you want to know more. And so I'm glad to see that listenership were up and that people were actually actively engaged. People were listening sometimes, you know, to the entire podcast in one shot. Very few of you tuned out. I mean, it's incredible, but it's almost like you, you've been waiting for this type of series to happen. So I'm so thankful that that happened. Okay, so what did I learn um, after doing four podcast episodes on abortion. So the first lesson I learned was how important education and awareness is. It's so critical. You know, in Canada, there's about 450 to 490,000 live births every year. And over the past 10 years, there's been anywhere between, you know, 89 to basically 90 to 100,000 uh, abortions per year. And I couldn't find statistics about, you know, the age and the demographic of of those people who are pursuing abortion, but I can only imagine that they're younger women and younger partners. Um, that's just my inference. That's just my assumption. So please, if somebody has information out there that proves me wrong, I'd love to, to see it. But that's just my inference. Um, and then I think about, okay, if I'm a young person, let's just say I'm in my teens and uh, I'm with a partner, and where, and I, you know, there's an unplanned, unexpected pregnancy. Where do I go for more information about what decisions I need to make? And let's say prior to that, abortion's never taught in schools; it's never discussed in schools. Um, but I keep hearing, oh, like my friend says, hey, like, have you thought about an abortion? You should definitely think about it. And, you know, you're young, you don't want to come home and tell your parents that, hey, I'm pregnant, and I'm like still in high school, or I'm just exiting high school. Um, so what do you do? You you go to your doctor, perhaps, and you say, hey, like, you know, I'm thinking of having an abortion. And many times, doctors refer 
uh, clients to abortion clinics to get more information. And I just think that that's kind of strange because you're going to a clinic that performs abortion when maybe your decision hasn't been made yet on whether or not you want to have an abortion or not. So I was really inspired um, by my conversation with Jackie Jeffs where uh, maternity homes were talked about and social supports were talked about and how more awareness of these supports are necessary. And the parallel I saw with my conversation with Dr. Jill Doctoroff from the National Abortion Federation, basically saying that our doctors in Canada are not equipped and trained to have those conversations with, uh, with clients. So it's almost like both pro-choice and pro-life groups were agreeing that education and awareness is so vital and so important. And so I thought about that some more, and I'm like, wow, I, you know, I went into this not knowing anything. And, you know, I think about all the young people out there who know nothing about maternity homes, social supports, are not having informed conversations with their doctors and automatically are, are, are going for an abortion. So the reason why I think education awareness is important is not because I'm pushing some pro-life message. I want more people to be as informed as possible before they make that decision. And what's really interesting too is that, uh, again, uh, Jill Doctoroff, Jackie Jeffs, mentioned the need for supporting partners, families, everybody involved. It's not it's not just what it's not just the woman. It's everybody's involved. Everyone should have the supports not necessary to to make that decision. So again, very interesting and I think that's something that politicians and governments should really, you know, try to promote more. Education and awareness on abortion. We want to make sure that people if they choose abortion are making the most informed decision and they feel that the information that they have is readily available. Now, I don't know about the school system. I could see that being a very challenging topic to broach with our our school boards to, to include like a curriculum on abortion. I get that. I totally understand that. But I do think that there's merit when we acknowledge that you know, pregnancies are ha- un- unplanned pregnancies may be happening at much younger ages. That the touch points for kids to receive support are in schools and probably with their general physician. And so, if there's some way we can get on board with with talking about abortion at the very least in our schools, you know, it might lead to a better kind of uh, policy or a better future in the in in the sense that people who are going forward with abortion feel that they have had all the information uh, at their fingertips and they can make the right decision for them and for their families. Um, This is not, uh, you know, suggesting in any way that um, uh, uh, abortion's bad. I just, there's just such a massive data gap that I wasn't able to find about how many people who pursue abortion feel like they had enough information before they made that decision. And I can only speak for myself. I don't think that um, there is a lot of people who feel that way. I could be completely wrong. And please let me know if you have some stats, if you know some stuff that I don't, I think that's really important. Which leads me, to, leads me great segue, to my second point, destigmatizing conversations on abortion. Okay, so in my conversation with, with Jill Doctoroff, I learned so much about how people with abortion, people who are going through abortions or thinking about it, there's this massive stigma on it. And, and you know, the fact that I did a four-part series on abortion proves that stigma a little bit. I remember reading something like, no matter where you stand on abortion, no one will ever recommend anyone to go through with an abortion. I thought that was interesting because there's this massive stigma on, on this medical procedure. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I had read things that it causes depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts for both the woman and the partner. And it's just, it opens up a whole, um, uh, mental health issue for so many involved. And, um, I think that stems a lot from our inability sometimes to not talk about abortion. The only thing I can compare this to is illicit and illegal drugs. So I'm a 
kid of the 80s. I grew up in the 90s. And I can tell you, in the 90s, for those that grew up in the 90s, nobody, and I mean nobody, nobody, bad boy, remember that? Anybody? Okay. Nobody talked about illicit drugs. Nobody talked about illegal drugs. It was never discussed. It was always shunned. It was like the big elephant in the room. And you just could not find anyone to rationally talk about it. And, you know, you as a kid, you didn't know anything about illegal drugs, but you go to the doctor's office and there's nothing there about, you know, pamphlets on abortion, or sorry, abortion, on illegal drug use and safe injection sites. There was none of that. There was no political appetite, I don't think, at the time to even discuss it. And I tell you, I went to the doctor's office recently. There are pamphlets on, um, you know, drug and substance abuse and getting help. And I, <laughs> I wasn't at a safe injection site. I was at my doctor's office. And so I've noticed over the past 10, 20 years, there's been a shift and a more openness to discussing illegal drug use and finding the supports that you need for it, at least from a public health uh, perspective. I don't see that about abortion. Um, I don't see that about, you know, having open discussions about abortion. And I don't know why. I actually think that we should lean into this the way we lean into honest and open conversations about illicit drug use. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, uh, and again, I don't have statistics handy to back me up on this, but I can only imagine that, again, shameless plug for the podcast, but through open dialogue and conversation, people might be making better choices or at least more informed choices. So, you know, if you do have an illegal drug use problem or habit, uh, you know where to get help. And you know that, um, you know, there's there's doctors, there's nurses, there's, there's uh, support systems in place. And it's relatively easy to find that information. And I want to do, I want to to advocate to destigmatize abortion so that we can actually have these open and honest conversations um, and that we feel that, you know, people who are thinking about abortion feel supported through the process. You know, so if it's having pamphlets, and again, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe your doctor's office has a lot of information on abortion. I just, you know, I, I can only speak on my experience, but I just don't see it. And I'd strongly advocate for us to, you know, Let's openly talk about it. Let's let's find a way where we don't, you know, you know, point the finger and blame people and make them feel shitty about their decisions and instead just talk about it openly and have people feel like they're welcome and they they feel like their voice matters on it. And I'd also like my last learning is well, there's so many, but my last learning is probably I'm so confused why politicians are so quick to say they're pro-life or pro-choice. It's almost like they have to prove themselves to everyone. Look at me, I'm I'm pro-choice or pro-life. I find that odd and strange because it's a nuanced conversation. We're not always pro-life, we're not always pro-choice. But um you know if you just if you just look at a politician um and ask them, what are your thoughts on abortion? It's immediately this I'm your pro-choice or I'm your pro mostly now it's pro-choice. I'm your pro-choice politician because they need to make sure that the pro-choice uh, groups understand that they're they're not about quote unquote making decisions on behalf of women's bodies, which I think is a phrase that you know we need to move away from because again it's a very nuanced conversation and phrases like that you know pit us against each other. You know nobody's trying to make uh, decisions on behalf of anyone. It's just it's not nearly as cut and dry as that. It's very complicated. So anyways, uh, I think education awareness is important. I think destigmatizing abortion is important. I think we need to be skeptical of our politicians when they come out and they say they're pro-choice and pro-life. And we as Canadians, we have to recognize that this debate is not settled. You know, it is not because, uh, you know, our country has no laws on abortion. There's no laws. So in the absence of, of no laws, you get... Um, different provinces interpreting um, abortion differently. And so, you know, I think it was New Brunswick that just outlawed um, abortions uh, to be performed in clinics. Now they can only be provided in hospitals. To me, that's interesting. Um, uh, you know, so 
So I think we need to have open dialogue on abortion more. And I know what's interesting is uh, pro-life and pro-choice groups, I think they notice this. And this is why the space is being at, uh, maybe taken up by, by those groups, because they notice that there is no education awareness. So both sides um, see this as an opportunity to spread education awareness. Um, and, you know, both sides are trying to actually, in a way, destigmatize the conversation at the very least. So I think this, there's a role here for governments to play, and that is to encourage discussion on abortion, to encourage this destigmatization of it, uh, so we can get to better policy recommendations and better, better, uh, outcomes for our, for our, uh, uh, our citizenry, whatever those outcomes are. I think an outcome is, you know, did you feel informed before you made your decision? Yes, no, yes is a good response. And I think that's something we should work towards. Uh, anyways, that's my, those are my final thoughts on the abortion podcast series. Uh, thanks so much for, for listening to my final thoughts. I wrote a blog on this. It's on my website. It's also on medium.com about my lessons learned. And I'll tell you again, this has been, this has been incredible. But this is, I think, how the podcast is going to move forward um, by take, tackling big issues uh, over a month, maybe even six weeks, um, and really get into the, the weeds of the issue. So that, again, you come out and you come away with you know, something that, oh man, I, I didn't know that. And, and this person from this organization you know, shed some light on that. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, with the series. I'm so glad that so many of you have reached out telling me that you felt the same way. I can't wait for uh, the next podcast series, which I think it starts next week. I, I should look at my calendar. Um, but the next topic series will be on dun, da, 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 gun violence. So gun violence is huge in our urban centers across uh, Canada. Um, but, you know, people have very different views on how we combat gun violence. And so I don't want to give too much away. I'm going to sit down with community groups. I'm going to sit down with um, uh, gun advocates. And uh, my hope is that, you know, uh, through this podcast, it sparks conversation, it sparks discussion, and we get to a place where we at least appreciate different perspectives on it. And, you know, that's what I want to also promote, the idea that it's okay to have differences of opinions uh, but just appreciating someone else's perspective and showing them uh, the respect. And again, knowing that this is a very nuanced conversation, knowing that this is there's so many different uh, avenues to to go down. There's no singular solution. I think it's really important. Anyways, I really hope you enjoyed this final thoughts uh, episode I've done on abortion. I feel like I shouldn't just you know end the abortion discussion and uh, and then just jump into gun violence and not have like a bridge. Uh, for you to um, cross before we get into the next topic. But again, I'm always, always, always looking for um, ideas you have, um, help with social media and marketing, help with any and all aspects of the podcast. So again, feel free to reach out to me, www.thestrongandfreepodcast.com. All the information is there. Uh, I'm so looking forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives. Again, as always, stay balanced, stay informed. Let me know what you think, and I can't emphasize enough how much I'm so thankful that you've listened, that you are listening, that you're continuing this uh, journey that I'm on with uh, continuing more balanced discussion. Thanks again. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Happy Halloween if we don't speak before, <laughs> and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Strong and Free Podcast. And remember, this is the place where you can share ideas regardless of your politics and views. So if you have somebody who would be great for this podcast, feel free to reach out. Strong and Free Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or email me at strongandfree2018 at gmail.com. As always, stay balanced, stay informed, continue learning, and I'll catch you in the next one.